Hi everyone, welcome back to another lecture in the biotechnology series. Today we have a fusion lecture related to both immunology and biotechnology. We will look at cancer and the immune system in a nutshell, and then talk about antibody drug conjugates development and how they play a role in cancer immunotherapy. So let's get started. Here are the lecture objectives. We will have a very brief overview of the key characteristics of cancer, and look at how our immune system monitors cancer cell development and how cancer cells evade the immune system. Then we will switch gears to look at various aspects of antibody drug conjugates, or abbreviated as ADC. Cancer talks can be very lengthy. Here, I will just present a very abbreviated talk that is related to our topic of discussion. For the cells that have the ability to divide and replicate, we refer the process as cell division, and it is maintained by the cell cycle. DNA replications needs to happen before the cell can split into two. But sometimes mutations can happen in the DNA due to various reasons, and are not corrected. Now this can result in uncontrolled cell division. Cancer is the result of mutations that cause uncontrolled cell growth. Cancer is the common name. A more medical name for cancer is neoplasia. It means the development and uncontrolled division of abnormal cells. This causes the infiltration and damage of surrounding normal body tissue. When neoplasia happens in a solid organ, the group of abnormal cells is called tumors. A benign tumor refers to a mass of abnormal cells that have not invaded neighboring tissues, and is localized and limited in size. Sometimes the benign tumor stays benign for a very long time, but sometimes it can develop into a malignant state. A malignant tumor is a mass of abnormal cells divided rapidly and invades neighbor tissues. It can also affect distant tissues. This is because of its metastatic property. Cancer development can happen in any given tissue in the body. But some tissues are more prone to cancer development, such as the lung, breast, prostate, and colon. Now, some of the causes are because of genetic factors. Some are environmental factors, and some are the combination of two. When we look at the genetic abnormality of cancer cells, the mutation can be found in genes that regulate the cell cycle. These mutations can be caused by environmental factors such as smoking, diet, and sun exposure. But some mutation is also hereditary. In particular, female individuals with BRAC1 and BRAC2 genes have a much higher risk for developing breast cancer. Exposure to chemicals, radiation. And viruses can result in healthy cells becoming cancerous. Now we have two definitions for these environmental cancerous factors. First is mutagens. They refer to chemicals that increase the risk of obtaining mutation in DNA. Now note that not all mutations are cancerous. For example, when mutations happen to interfere with cell cycles, the cells can no longer go through the cell division process and survive, so they die. But when mutagens are known to increase the risk of developing cancer, they are called carcinogens. Examples such as tobacco smoking, UV light. Some viruses are also known to cause cancers, such as the human papillomas virus, tied to cervical cancer development. Healthy cells obtain multiple mutations in their DNA due to carcinogen exposure. Now, these cells may not always develop into cancer because there are genes that can regulate or can suppress. 
cancer development. Now these genes are called tumor suppressor genes. They are responsible for preventing uncontrolled cell proliferation. When these genes function well, they can either initiate DNA repair mechanisms to repair minor damage or initiate apoptosis when there are major damage to the cell. But when there are mutations in these tumor suppressor genes, it will result in increased cell growth and may lead to cancer. Now, there are also genes called oncogenes. These genes have a role in cell signal transduction and gene transcription. Mutations in oncogenes are responsible for uncontrolled cell division. Certain common features distinguish cancer cells from normal healthy cells. For example, they can stimulate their own growth with an overactive S phase, avoid cell death, actively proliferate to form tumors, promote new blood vessel growth to receive more nutrients to support rapid cell growth, and spread from tissues of origin. Perhaps the most important characteristic that is relevant to this lecture is its ability to evade the immune response through the expression of self-antigens and secrete immune modulators that suppress the immune responses. Mutations acquired by somatic cells during oncogenesis can give rise to tumor-specific antigens and tumor-associated antigens. Now, tumor-associated antigens are expressed by tumor and normal cells, but tumor cells have more of these surface antigens compared to normal cells, and many of these increased antigens are to support cell proliferation and growth. In terms of tumor-specific antigens, these are different than tumor-associated antigens. They are only present on tumor cells, but not on normal cells. These tumor-specific antigens are structurally different than normal cell surface antigens. They can be recognized by CD8 T cells as a non-self protein and lead to an adaptive response. Now, these tumor-specific antigens are also ideal candidates for antibodies, antibody therapies, and antibody drug conjugates. Cancer immunosurveillance refers to the ability of immune cells to recognize tumor cell antigens and produce a response that attempts to eliminate cancer cells. The process is broken down into three phases. The first phase is elimination. This is when natural killer cells and T cells recognize tumor antigens. Now, if this phase is successful, it will restore to normal tissue. Now, when it is in equilibrium, cancer cells that are not eliminated are in the stationary phase. They can acquire more mutations in the process. And when escape happens, the tumor growth in size and can break off to distant sites. At this point, the immune system has been overwhelmed and cannot eliminate the tumors effectively. Besides NK cells and T cells, antibodies can also fight cancer cells with antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity, or abbreviated as ADCC. Now specifically, after the variable region of IgG binds to the tumor antigen, its FC region can bind to FC receptors on NK cells. Now this causes NK cells to proliferate and secrete granzymes and perforins to help eliminate tumor cells. Although we have both the innate and adaptive response to fight tumor cells, tumors can evade the immune system by lacking proper surface molecules and co-stimulations. For example, they can hide from immune surveillance 
with no antigenic peptides (MHC) adhesion molecules or co-stimulatory molecules, so that T cells cannot detect them. But tumors, by definition, are non-self, but they can trick immature dendritic cells into taking up tumor antigens and present as self antigens, so that T cells cannot be activated. Tumors can also evade the immune system by secreting inhibitory molecules and create protective barriers. That they can induce the secretion of TGF beta to inhibit TC and Th1 cells, and recruit T regulatory cells that secrete IL10 to suppress the T cell responses further. Second, tumors can create an immune-privileged site by secreting collagen and forming a physical barrier around the tumor. This way, T cells can no longer get to the tumor cells and perform the killing actions. It is unfortunate that most of us probably know someone with cancer. Now, so that means tumor cells are very successful in evading our immune system response. Now, the next question is how to remediate or remediate cancer with specific immune-based therapy. Now, here we are strictly referring to antibody drug conjugate therapies. When we think about ADCs. The idea is to have a magical bullet that is very specific and very selective in killing tumor cells and sparing normal cells. By having such high specificity, we can therefore add more cytotoxic agents to the antibody and have it delivered to the tumor cells and not the normal cells. So to increase the therapeutic window of cancer treatment, the idea of a magic bullet is not new. It was first proposed by Paul Ehrlich in 1913, but it was only an idea until about 50 years ago in the 70s, when hybridoma-based technology was developed to manufacture monoclonal antibodies. After that, scientists began to test the feasibility of linking a drug to the antibody and having it as a delivering agent for a drug payload. Now, it eventually became antibody drug conjugates, and the first ADC was approved by the FDA in the year 2000. From pharmacist or pharmaceutical scientist perspective, the most common cancer therapy we deal with is chemotherapy. It means using chemical drugs to kill tumor cells. But the downside is that some very strong cell-killing activities from chemical drugs are too toxic to be used on their own. Now, more recently, we have more and more monoclonal antibodies that target tumor cells. And they are considered a part of the immunotherapy for cancer treatment, but most of the time, monoclonal antibodies are not toxic enough to confer a high killing. So here comes antibody drug conjugates. It's a combination of chemotherapy and immunotherapy, with the goal of delivering very toxic chemical drugs. With high specificity to tumor cells only. The component of antibody drugs is quite straightforward. They consist of the monoclonal antibody, a linker that connects the antibody with the cytotoxic agent. Now, the challenging part of ADC's development is to have the right linker technology to link with an exact number of drug molecules per antibodies. Now, this figure shows you six drug molecules per one antibody, and this is needed to be consistent with every antibody during the production process. 
This figure from a review article nicely summarizes the features or requirements of each of the components in designing a antibody drug conjugate. Now first, the tumor antigen needs to be highly homogeneous for a given tumor type. It should be low or no expression on healthy tissue and can be recognized by antibodies with high affinity. Second, the antibody needs to have high affinity and it should be either a chimeric or humanized monoclonal antibody to decrease immunogenicity and with a relatively long half-life in the body. The reason for the preciseness of drug molecules is that they are highly toxic with IC50 in the sub-nanomolar range. Now, it means it only takes a nanomolar or even less of the compound to kill 50% of cells in testing. It is highly toxic. So if more drugs get linked to the antibody, the excess drug is not only wasteful but also dangerous to other healthy cells. Lastly, the linker needs to be stable enough in the blood circulation but at the same time be able to release the drug payload at the target site when appropriate. Now, I was involved in some ADC development during my early phase of my PhD study, and I can tell you that the linker technology is the most difficult part of the ADC development process. The basic mechanism of action of ADC is actually quite straightforward. The ADC first binds to tumor cell surface antigens and it gets internalized and transported into lysosome. The protein structure in the antibody gets degraded in the lysosome and the payload drug is released in the process. The free drug will then diffuse into the cytosol or into the DNA or wherever its actions at and have a cytotoxic effect in the target cell. Although ADCs are quite effective, but tumor cells can also generate resistance against the drug. For example, the cells can downregulate or decrease the number of antigens on their surface so lesser or fewer ADCs can bind and internalize. And secondly, inside the cell, the cells can also decrease the number of lysosomes, so the drug release process becomes less efficient. Now in summary, the key features to be considered in ADC include high tumor cell selectivity. The antibody itself needs to be low immunogenicity, and high stability in circulation, the payload drugs are linked uniformly and released in a controlled fashion. Lastly, the drug needs to be toxic enough to effectively kill the tumor cell. Now when we look at individual components, first for the target tumor antigens, they need to be having a limited heterogeneity, they need to be highly expressed, and low shedding. The antigen also needs to downregulate after ADC internalization because it can minimize excess drug intake. In other words, enough drug is enough. We talked about different antibody isotypes in the immunology series. Now, when we consider antibodies for antibody drug conjugate development, it is really preferred to use IgG1. Now because for IgG1, in addition to its ability to bind to antigens, the FC region of IgG1 can also bind to FC receptors and participate in FC mediated functions such as antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity. As for the linkers, they need to be stable enough in the circulation. They also need to have no pharmacological actions by themselves because we don't want to have additional cytotoxicity. Now, the site for conjugation need to be very specific and can be controlled so that every batch is going to be the same. It also need to have an optimum drug to antibody ratio so that it 
deliver a nice balance of a toxic load. Now, in terms of the linkers, we won't go to be too specific or too technical. There are three types. One type is non-cleavable. Second type is cleavable. And there is another type called glutathione sensitive. Now, overall, these are the three major linkers that are used in the antibody drug conjugates that are currently in the market. So very briefly, conjugation strategies are usually some form of a covalent linking. Now there are only several amino acids that can be easily reacted. First one is lysine. Now I, lysine have a free uh, primary amine ending there, and with that primary amine being available, it can be re easily, easily reacted with a carboxylic COOH ending with a reaction called NHS ester uh, conjugation. And through this conjugation, you can covalently link a uh, drug that has a carboxylic end to the lysine ending. Another functional group or another amino acid that can be utilized for conjugations is a cysteine residual. Now through a cysteine residual, you can do something called the glutathione type of those conjugation. In terms of the cytotoxic payload drug examples, here are a few. The first one is mitensinoids. Now, mitensinoid is a tubulin inhibitor, so it, it kind of prevents the cell division process or inhibit the cell division process. It is used in trazuzumab emtemsin, which is a drug antibody drug conjugate that is approved for breast cancer use. Now, we will talk about this drug in the later slides. Now, notice that the drug itself, the IC50, is 10 to the il negative 11 to 10 to the negative 9 molar. So it's sub nanomolar. So it's very, very toxic. Now, another example of tubulin inhibitors is. Or statins. In addition to affecting tubulin activities during the cell division process, other cytotoxic payloads can also affect the DNA structure or DNA or RNA replication process. And here are the examples. I'm not going to name every single one of those, but here are for your information. Now let's look at one ADC example that is trazuzumab emtemsin. Now it is currently approved for the treatment of breast cancer. Now more specifically, uh, the second line drug for HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer patients that previously treated with trazuzumab or other tensin therapy that failed and they are the candidate for this drug. Now it is a antibody drug conjugate, so it is two parts. The first part is the trazuzumab under the brain name Herceptin and is linked to the DM1, which is a mitensinoid type of uh, drugs that is highly toxic and affect tubulin activities. Now this drug was approved in 2013. So why uh, this drug is useful? Now, first of all, uh, HER2 positive breast cancer means that uh, this particular type of breast cancer has a highly expression of this human epidermal growth factor 2 receptor. Now, this overexpression is considered oncogenic and it's found in 15 to 20 percent of all primary breast cancer patients. There are three separate mechanisms of actions uh, in the TDM1, which is illustrated with A, B, and C in this figure. First of all, the monoclonal antibody itself can bind to HER2 receptor and inhibit HER2 signaling. And secondarily, the FC region of the antibody can participate in antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity that we just talked about. 
and third, it is the internalization of this entire antibody drug conjugate and broken down by lysozymes, and through the release of DM1 binding to microtubule, affecting mitotic divisions, and eventually all of these mechanisms can lead to apoptosis or programmed cell death of the tumor cell. So is this drug better? Now, it was published uh, you know, a while ago, certainly, and when it's approved, it's most likely to be quite effective. And here are just some of the figures that I pulled from this study, which was a three-year study to look at how this TDM1 compared to other therapy in HER2-positive patients. So the first primary endpoint of this study showed that TDM1 extended medium overall survival by nearly six months compared to other drugs that is used in the study. And the second primary endpoint shows that TDM1 significantly improved progression-free survival the patient treated with this antibody drug conjugate had more time without disease progression, which is 9.6 months, compared to 6.4 months when it's treated with other therapies. I'm wrapping up this lecture with some thoughts on future directions of ADC. Now, we mentioned previously that tumors have ways to evade ADCs as well. So the battle is still on, trying to overcome no mechanisms of resistance. Now it may be accomplished by increasing drug penetration and identifying new antigens for targeting. Identifying new toxic drugs with a novel mechanisms of action may also help. Another interesting area of development is to investigate using non-antibody targeting agents to deliver the drug payload, such as antibody fragments, or even using nucleic acid-based targeting agents. Now, we will talk more about other novel agents in the near future. That is all for this lecture, and thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time talking about CRISPR technology, and stay tuned. Bye.